Hi everyone, good afternoon. Welcome to Melbourne Recital Centre. Welcome to Melbourne International Jazz Festival. My name's Chelsea Wilson, thrilled to be here with you this afternoon. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands we are meeting upon today, the people of the Kulin Nations, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging, and acknowledge any First Nations people joining us today. I'd like to thank the principal partners of Melbourne International Jazz Festival, Creative Victoria and the Australia Council, the Visard Foundation, the RISE Fund and Australian Government Initiative, the Helen McPherson Smith Trust and the US Consulate who really supported in bringing this event to life. So we really thank them for their support and trust. This panel, your brain on jazz. We are very excited to hear this incredible lineup of speakers talking about their research. This is presented in partnership with the Clinical and Music Neuroscience Lab at the University of Melbourne. I'm going to hand over to our incredible facilitator, Paul Barclay, who is going to introduce our panelists. Please give him a round of applause. Should we just say something about the Slido function? Oh, yes. That'd be good. Sorry. No, that's okay. <laughs> if you have any questions that you'd like to ask the panel, you can ask them digitally. So you can head to Slido, that's S-L-I-D-O, on your device, and pop in the code M-I-J-F for Melbourne International Jazz Festival, and type in your question, and it will go shush, straight over to Paul. Brilliant. Thanks, Chelsea. Yeah, it'd be good to get you involved in asking some questions as we go along. Um, and uh, it's a really neat little device. You just type your questions in as you go. I'll check on my screen as we're talking to see if there are any questions from you. Uh, it's a tremendous pleasure, of course, to be here to host this session of the Melbourne International Jazz Festival. I have to also say it's so good that festivals are back that music festivals are back, that live music is back in Melbourne after those long, lean months of lockdown. Uh, I'm Paul Barclay. I'm from the ABC here in Melbourne. I'm a broadcaster and journalist. This session, as you've heard, is called Your Brain on Jazz. I have absolutely no qualifications to talk about jazz or the brain, um, other than the fact that I'm uh, a fan of, uh, of jazz music and most genres of music, um, and I know that something goes on up here when I'm listening to music and uh, when I see it performed. Uh, but we do have a fantastic panel of experts who do know what they're talking about, you'll be glad to know. Uh, let me just say though that I've just returned to Melbourne uh, this year after decades of living away, and I'm from Melbourne. I left when I was in my early 30s, went to uni here, uh, lived here, and uh, then left, and um, despite it being a tough year, it is fantastic to be back. What I've always loved about this city, uh, one of the things that brought me back, actually, is its music scene, particularly the contemporary jazz scene for which this city is now globally known. So it's tremendous that that's now happening again, and I can't tell you how glad I was to hear that the festival was going ahead. Anyway, we're going to be talking about uh, the interaction of, uh, between music and the brain. Today, there's been a lot of research in this area in recent times, and our speakers are going to give you the lowdown. Let me introduce you, first of all, to, on my immediate right, Professor Sarah Wilson, Pro Vice-Chancellor, Student Life at the University of Melbourne, uh, internationally recognised expert in cognitive neuroscience and clinical neuropsychology. Uh, she's pioneered music neuroscience research in Australia and was founding director of Music, Mind and Wellbeing, an interdisciplinary initiative linking neuroscience with music and emotional and social wellbeing, fostering research spanning music, science, health and education. Next to Sarah is Dr Tim Willison, Australian Institute of Music lecturer, artist and researcher. He's also a professional performing musician, a jazz guitarist and an active contributor to the Melbourne jazz scene mm. since moving here from France in uh, yeah. 2009. Well, lucky you. And Tim has a PhD in music uh, as well, music performance from Monash University. And Dr. Margaret Osborne is a senior lecturer in psychology and music at the Melbourne School of Psychological Sciences. And we'll be hearing a bit from Margaret today about her area of research, music performance anxiety. Uh, 
interesting and also hearing about some ways to overcome such anxiety. But first of all, let's rip into it, Sarah. Um, the session's called Your Brain on Jazz. In other words, what's happening to our brain when we're performing jazz, listening to jazz? What is happening to it during, during that time? So, thanks, Paul, and welcome, everyone. Really great that you've come along and appreciate you doing so. I think the best way to answer that question is to think about a contrasted state, which is what's happening to our brain when we're listening to music or we're performing something that we've already learned. And then we'll move to the jazz and that'll give you a sense. So if we put someone in the scanner, the MRI scanner, and look at what their brain is doing um, while they're either performing or thinking about performing a pre-learnt piece of music, we'll see pretty much all of the brain light up. So the brain really gets engaged in music. And there's a bunch of different networks that underlie the processing and the production of the music. So there's the auditory processing, there's the visual, if they're reading the music or visualising things to go with the music, there's the motor aspects, there's the emotional processing, then there's the sensory motor linking and with the emotional experience. And then there's this kind of generative component, which is the kind of, I guess, creative aspect. There might also be the social component switched on if you're doing it with others. You might be doing a solo or you might be looking at the audience. So there's a lot going on. And when we look at the brain when it's performing something it already knows, we see that it's really tightly coupled or connected. All of those networks are tightly regulated and there's this frontal network in our frontal lobe called the cognitive control network that's like the CEO of the brain that directs all the network traffic. And it's tightly coupled and telling those other networks what to do. So that's what we know from a lot of research over many years. As Paul mentioned, more recently, we're really starting to discover what happens in the brain when we do jazz. And it's quite a different story. We don't see that tight coupling. We see these networks on, but they're only very loosely connected. And that, you know, CEO, the cognitive control network, is really decreased in its activation. So it's got what we call hypofrontality. Now, this is kind of fascinating, because if we think about what's going on in the mind, and we'll talk about that more, of a jazz performer, we know they have to be freed up uh, to create, um, in real time, new ideas and play those ideas. And so the theory behind that is that this loose connectivity allows this bottom-up generation from a network, which is called the default mode network, which is our memories and our um, kind of emotions, the things that we kind of just mull over when we're not doing anything at all. This network generates these ideas and starts to do it in real time. And this has been linked to this idea of flow. This loose connectivity allows the brain to get into this um, relaxed flow state, which is improvisation. So that's kind of the current theory, um, and there's good research to support that now. Does that make sense to you, Tim, as someone who's both studied this and performs jazz? It, it does, actually, yes. Um, and, uh, you know, experientially, performing jazz and to do it well requires that you aren't actually kind of thinking of anything else that's going on around you, um, and that you're... Um, open to uh, the inspiration that might come to you from the other people you're, you're performing with, uh, and also your, the own ideas that might emerge in your mind at that moment. So um, when it's done well and when it's happening well for the performer, they're not, it, it is characterised by that feeling of not you're thinking, but you're not thinking. Um, the thinking that might be happening is very much um, being aware of ideas that you have and, it, and, and selecting what you're going to do next and also kind of self-monitoring slightly, but not too much, you know. Um, but 
it's it's really paramount for you know jazz performers to not be too um, conscious of of themselves. Otherwise, it gets it, it it gets in the way, and they start to edit too much, and and that flow state gets interrupted. But so when you're playing a solo or about to play a solo, you're not visualising in your mind the notes that you're about to play or visualising where your fingers are going to be on the fretboard. You, that's, that's not happening. You're, what, is, what, is, what is happening in your brain? Yes. Are you conscious of that? Well, I, I am very much conscious of it because I, that's a big part of my research centred on, on all of that sort of thing. Um, and by and large, um, improvisers ideas that improvisers have during an improvisation and there's been a few uh, papers published on this and two really good academics in Australia actually, um, Wendy Hargraves I think at Griffith University and Leon de Bruin um, here in Melbourne, shout out to Leon, um, and one of the top five nicest people in Melbourne as well, <laughs> but he the generally very kind of at a, at a sort of general sense the ideas that we have when we're improvising tend to come from three sources. Um, one of those is ideas that are motor generated, so things that you know improvisers will practice, will practice and practice things to get them under our fingers to the point where um, I know how to walk across the stage without thinking about it, okay? And eventually your hands know how to do things and you don't seemingly need to think about it and they will just do it and so those are ideas that you might have even though you're not you may not kind of be able to hear them in a clear sense you'll have a, an idea of how they're about to sound um, and so those are the motor generated ideas then the strategy generated ideas are these ideas that you know if I it's there's they're coming from your understanding of music theory and music and, and harmony so for example there's a, a chord progression in the key of C. All of the chords are all in the key of C. Um, so I know if I play an ascending C major scale, that'll get me home, right? Mm. I don't need to hear it. I'm, it's, it's a strategy generated idea, right? And then there are the things that have been called um, audiation generated ideas, and, which are the things that you very clearly kind of hear in your mind. Um, and so those are things that are um, you know, everyone can experience audiation generated ideas and, um, you know, anytime you have an, some kind of earworm, that's, that's where you're audiating, you're, you're thinking in music. Um, but they're the, they're the ideas that you hear. So when, you, when you're in the heat of battle, like when you're on stage and you're going for it, you'll be using your eyes to kind of look at your instrument, maybe to kind of get sort of visual cues for the feedback of the instrument. But there'll be moments where you shut your eyes to get to, to visualise. I mean, for myself, it's always it always seems to be things on the instrument. Um, but those those sources of ideas then become all intermingled and mixed up, and feed into each other very much. Um, yeah, uh, Margaret, does that ring a bell for you in terms of the work that you do with with musicians? Yeah, I'm so excited to hear that. I just get continually excited by you know, speaking um, with Sarah and Tim because, um, so, uh, yeah, my area of interest is music performance anxiety and one of the number one triggers to that is the self-critical thinking and the self-consciousness that can come about when we're performing and we're really worried, particularly in front of an audience. Um, you don't get so much anxiety when you're rehearsing in the practice room, but when you're in front of an audience, you typically, and also with, with ensemble members as well, what are they thinking of me? You know, will I, will I perform well enough? What if I make a mistake? What if I'm not good enough, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and I've done quite a bit of research looking at a way to uh, overcome that, and that is a, a, a performance routine, a pre-performance routine of sorts. And one of the key elements is getting um, the performer to hear, see, and feel themselves exactly uh, performing the activity, the intended activity, exactly as the way they'd like to, um, they'd like for it to be executed. And so what that does is it really embodies um, physically, um, in that kinesthetic sense, the musician and performer in the moment and what they'd like to achieve, and, and so also works away from that self-critical thinking. Um, and stepping away from that, 
more broadly, performance anxiety, the other opposite of that is flow. So hearing Sarah talk about flow um, and how the, the you know, frontal areas of the brain are sort of partially sort of down-regulated, and, and for want of a better word, that, that is absolutely you know, the antithesis of, of anxiety. So it's very interesting um, mm. to see the parallels with this area of work. Mm. Having some trouble with my iPad here, so um, bear with me, hopefully. I can fix it up, uh, but it just seems to have frozen on me. Oh. Uh, so if you're asking a question there and it's not coming through, um, I'll perhaps see if uh, someone backstage can fix that up. Yeah, Sarah, it's, it's said that creativity, I've heard it said, that it's a product of the right side of the brain. I don't know whether this right side, left side of the brain stuff still holds up. Uh, you know, that you hear innovation comes from right brain thinkers and uh, left brain thinkers are more analytical and more logical. Uh, so does that mean that improvisation comes more from the right side of the brain or the left side of the brain, or is that, <laughs> is that not really going anywhere productive, that line? Yeah, so that's a good question, and, and there is a, a resonance of that still in the thinking of... Um, people in the community, this left brain, right brain, and it was a really big area of research back in the 60s and the 70s. And I think what it reflected was our tools for investigating the brain. We didn't have MRI machines back then. Uh, we had to rely on people presenting with a stroke, which might be left or right-sided, for instance, or on some other kind of injury. And so we tended to see the world through that lateralisation lens. And it's true, there are certain propensities or specialisations in the brain and um, in a right-handed in individual, we'd see that their language tends to be typically represented in the left. But when we look at music, it's actually bilateral. There might be a slight specialisation for processing pitch in the right, um, and that may as much reflect how we think about um, fine-grained analysis of sound as it moves through time, with the left doing fast, you know, kind of quick processing, which is what we need for language, mm. and the, the right doing slower spectral analysis for harmony and, you know, all the richness of that. But when it comes to improvisation, we're using all of our brain, and it's more just picking up on what... Um, Margie said that, you know, that, that cognitive control network we were talking about before, that when we're playing something we know is really doing this evaluation and it's comparing the, the score or what it should sound like based on the best recording you've ever heard versus what your brain's actually doing and that's that tight regulation. Whereas for jazz, we don't want that. We want the exact opposite of that. And so that's kind of needing to be um, released or down, you know, it, and, and bottom up all those networks, the motor network, the auditory network, that bringing the ideas and then there being this freer or f um, more flow-like state. And we need all of our brain on to do yeah. that. Look, let's talk a bit about music performance anxiety, Margaret. Um, how common is it and what causes it? Uh, good question. The, the, the rates vary depending on what study you look at, what tools they've used to measure it, and what, yeah, what population they're investigating. So, um, you know, for example, in, in, in uh, professional orchestral performers who, you know, 16-odd percent have been reported to experience severe stage fright to the point where it's disabling for themselves and their capacity to perform at a level that, that really is demonstrating, you know, the best that they can do. Um, and on the other hand, you, you've got studies that report it's 70, you know, it's experienced by 70-odd percent of, of musicians or performers. So um, it, it, it is varied. Um, I would say that, that most, if not all, people in any performance activity would experience a rise and elevation in some sort of physiological sensations, heart rate, um, breathing rate, sweatiness, you know, all the sorts of things that I myself might be experiencing right now. T Tim's which, nodding here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but that, that's what you need to execute, you know, 
to perform well. You know, if you were performing with the same level of energy that you had at 8 o'clock on a Sunday morning or when you're in a spa, it might not be the best that you could give, right? So, it's, also, um, it's also part of the high that you get yeah, from playing music. Yeah. It's like that, like, you, you kind of, there's that feeling of you're going to fall off, but then you don't fall off and you're like, you know, yeah. yeah. that's sort of the drug factor that comes yeah. from it too, you know, you need mm. that little bit of butterflies at the beginning and then, mm. and then when it, it's mm. like you're standing in front of people and it's just going great and yeah, mm. like, so it is, it is necessary. And, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that's really interesting, you talk about that, that social relatedness and connectedness and so, uh, you know, some work that I'm doing which I into a theory of, of well-being essentially uh, self-determination theory which works from self, uh, three basic psychological needs so they one of them is relatedness our, our, our ability to, to, to trust and feel accepted by the people that we're working with we're performing with you know that's vital um, and why is that vital well because that enables us to execute our level of competence so our skills abilities you know, they are, they are released in, in environments, in interpersonal social uh, contexts, uh, mostly. And, um, and thirdly, you know, the, the drive to perform and to learn to perform music, it requires so much motivation. It's also a theory of motivation. What is it that, how do we set a goal and how do we maintain ourselves to continue to work towards that goal? And... Um, and so when we've got competence, when we're able to feel comfortable that we're doing something well, that we have a level of autonomy, that we're able to, to self-direct the way that we approach the work that we do and how we perform, how we learn and perform, and also that relatedness, that sense of I'm supported by my colleagues on stage or in the ensemble, in the group, the trio, whatever it might be, or with the audience as well. When you've got those three needs being met, we can really flourish. Um, and you know, to manage anxiety, it's not just what happens on stage or just before. Yeah. It's also you've got to think of the person as a whole. And that's, that's where the complexity and the interest always lies. It's, you know, every musician is slightly different. Every person is slightly different. And so, yeah. So Sarah was talking about how the brain works differently depending on the type of music that you're performing classical music, okay, yeah. which is pre-learned music, essentially, mm. and jazz music where you're going into a spontaneous, creative state. So are classical musicians or jazz musicians more or less likely to suffer performance anxiety given those different mm. forms of performance? Yeah, some, uh, some research has been done investigating this question and, and typically what we know is that classical Western music, classical musicians um, typically report the highest level of performance anxiety because of that very uh, element of what Sarah was talking about before is that, you know, we, we have scores, we have multiple recordings with multiple edits and we have an audience that's getting used to hearing exquisitely more perfect uh, renditions of pieces. But that sets up this very question of, you know, will I make a mistake? What will they think of me? Is it as good as what I've heard many times before? Whereas jazz musicians typically report slightly less anxiety because of that, that generative component of what's, what exists is being created in the moment. And there's, there are different structures and requirements and foundations, absolutely. But it's, it, it, it comes from a different source and thereby they're a little less. But can I just say, but females and uh, female musicians generally across the board and, and, um, tend, and younger musicians tend to feel a little more anxious. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's Sarah, it's kind of like there's a benchmark that you're working toward with a classical performance, mm. whereas there's just not that expectation at all with a, with a jazz performance. Like, you know from the outset that the music you're going to hear performed, even if they're performing tunes that have been recorded on an album before, they're just not going to sound the same, so you don't have to replicate it in that way. Perhaps that's got something to do with the anxiety? For sure. So there's, it's, it's this idea that I can create something different and, in fact, my mistakes might lead me down an interesting path that mm. will be uh, lead to a better performance than if I try and play it note perfect. And so the interest factor is what's different or what deviates as opposed to you know, a, a perfect 
rendition of a, a, a predetermined um, piece. And I think that's what we need, and as we've been talking about for jazz musicians, to, to have that looser connectivity and that freer mental state to, to play well. Yeah. I mean, Tim was talking about how the brain chemicals, the brain drugs can be activated when he's playing. I mean, I can't really talk to that because I'm not a musician, but I know when I listen to music, something is going on in my head. And I know when I talk to people who've been unable to see music performed during this period of lockdown, that they feel that something has been missing in terms of their mood. And people seek out live music, not just to see gifted musicians play, but for how it makes them feel. So is there some chemical release going on? Um, mm. You know, dopamine and, and so yep. on bouncing around in the brain? There certainly is. There's two chemicals that have had a lot of research and that we know are really important. And the first is dopamine. And that's really the reward network that gives you that hit or that buzz um, that Tim was talking about and, and a little bit of anxiety and the anticipation and we know there's a pathway that it moves through in the brain and then there's this structure called the nucleus accumbens which is the same structure that we um, have activated when we orgasm um, or is the well, same well. structure that is <laughs> <laughs> activated from drugs. So, you know, sex, drugs, rock and roll, <laughs> it's, not, it's not just a coincidence. Um, and, and that network is actually, um, music has a direct line in to that, right? So this is kind of, uh, unlike other things that don't, this is kind of a powerful property of music and we think um, makes it, uh, give it, gives it evolutionary significance, why it's stayed with us over, over the, the times. But the other drug, which is just more recently getting some research in which we've got a, um, a PhD student looking at in the lab at the moment is oxytocin. And this is this idea of... Um, That's the kind of natural opiate, in, yeah. is that right? Mm. Yeah, karma muta. This idea mm. of feeling part of a greater connection of love and... and mm. um, being, you know, aligned either with each other. You might have um, tears of joy or um, chills, a little bit of an out-of-body thing. Um, and there's just an emerging body of literature looking at how music also activates this um, particular neurotransmitter and the, um, the, the ways that that might interact with the reward system because it's a bit more, it's a bit more complicated than just dopamine. And so we're about to start a study where we're going to administer um, oxytocin awesome. to people um, or a placebo and look at the differences in terms of how they report karma muta when they're listening to their um, favourite wow. pieces of music and when they get those kind of highs that come with that. Amazing, yeah, that, that, that's so interesting. And Tim, when you perform, is there a special way you go about preparing your head before you perform live? Yeah, well, um, there's sort of, there's often sort of two zones of preparation. So there's jazz musicians, we spend a lot of time practicing the language, like practicing being proficient, highly proficient speakers of the language of music. And our language, even though music isn't a language, it's language like, it has all these rules. Um, much like grammar that we, you know, in, in Eng we're all improvising now, by the way. Yeah, that's, that's right. I've, I've never said these words before, but the, I, I know implicitly how the language works and how to put the words together. And so mm. great improvisers and improvisers generally, like what we do is we spend all day um, learning more and more of the language and finding more creative ways to, to say the things that we want to say. Um, Something that really struck me once was a, an interview with the, you know, the existentialist and uh, feminist philosopher Simone de Beauvoir, and um, the interviewer, uh, the person interviewing her was no schlep. He was a very sharp person as well. Uh, and when she, you know, he said, "What do you think about this?" and and she said, "Well, I think this is what I think. I think this, mm. and it's informed by this point, 
and then this point, and then this point. Mm. To, to continue with that first point, I would say this, this, and this. So her response to that question was so structured, yeah. and she improvised it, right? Because she has this tremendous command over the language. Mm. So, so in terms of preparing, preparing for a concert and, and practice more generally, uh, improvisers, that's, that's what we do. You know, we, we are spending all day getting the language into our system, and that, that might mean doing things that put it into your that very you know, procedural, implicit memory where you the muscle memory, yep. and also things where you spend a lot of time singing. Um, so that, um, you know, we talk about levels of knowledge. You know, I can speak about something, you know, like I might be able to talk about the major scale, mm. okay, and I can tell you what it is, but it's another thing to then be able to sing the major scale and improvise with them and create with the major scale. That's yeah. another level of knowledge, right? Yeah. And so improvisers spend their whole day, you know, when they get to, when they don't have kids, <laughs> <laughs> spend their whole day trying to, to create um, more interesting ways to, to uh, say things and more poetic ways to say things. Then when you get to the, the, get to the gig, and if it's a high-pressured gig where you've got a critical audience, you know, people who know jazz and really understand, and you know, there might be other speakers of the music in the audience mm. who, who, who n can understand exactly what you're saying, you know, and often that's the case with jazz. Jazz is a, it's a very sort of niche music, and, and a lot of the people that go to the gigs are other musicians. Yeah, so uh, there's, there's that classic quote, isn't there? It's Miles, or maybe it was... Louis Armstrong has asked that question, what is jazz? And his response was, if you have to ask, you'll never know. Yeah. Um, which I love. Uh, and, but it's, I'm, you know, forever dragging people along to jazz gigs who are a little bit uncertain about whether they're going to like it. Yeah. And I think, in a way, when I think of what is jazz, jazz is improvisation, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, yeah. that is kind of the That's only exactly thing I can say that explains it. It's not... You know, if you see a jazz gig and it sounds like someone is playing their record for you, it's scarcely jazz. It has to be kind of freeing. Yeah, well, when we're listening to... Say we're listening... There's only two kinds of music. This, a, a preface to what I'm about to say. There's only two, I, I believe there's only two kinds of music, good music and bad music. So in all genres, yeah. there is great art, right? But let's say more pop music... What we, what we enjoy when we listen to it is we have this sort of ex, we've ex, these expectations and the reward when we, ah, the chorus is coming, the chorus, like, totally. I love the chorus, here it comes. <laughs> you know, and you're like, yes, and then, you, you know, you rock out with the chorus. Yep. With jazz, and, and once you learn to listen to jazz, it's the very next note that's coming. Yep. Do you know what I mean? Like, yep. with the great improvisers, what that reward is the very next note. So, um, when you get to see, you know, ex like, you know, the great improvisers here in Melbourne and then, you know, these next level up improvisers that seem to just have this life where they can just orbit the planet and do gigs all over the world. <laughs> they, you know, it's, you, you're hanging on the very next note and you're also listening to not only them but the way the other musicians in the, in the ensemble are conversing with them, you mm -hmm. know. So it's, it, there's that... Um, conversational aspect to it's it. It's incredible, yeah, actually, yeah. When, when you see it performed at the highest level. Yeah. It's just, it is incredible. Um, Margaret, I've got a question here for you from an, okay. a member of the audience. Okay. Uh, actually, a question I probably should have asked when we were talking about uh, performance anxiety. What kind of psychological techniques do you use with musicians um, to help them deal with anxiety? Okay, so um, yes, more broadly. So I guess first of all, um, if I go through that, that routine that I take people through and we can, we can, I use it in teaching and I also use it in, in, in clinical work. Um, so first of all, you want to be really clear about what it is that you're intending to do. So what's your intention for the activity you're about to perform? Uh, and so clearly already what you're doing is, is using that as a a way to sort of circumvent that negative critical thought. I don't want to make a mistake. Well, I want to, I want to pitch the opening note, you know, um, you know, I want a strong, clear, um, you know, confident execution of the opening note, for example, which is exactly what you want to achieve. And then 
you're working with down-regulating that physiological response, so getting in touch with the breathing, slowing it down, regulating it, because when we're under an anxious fight-flight uh, response, our, our breathing gets very elevated and we get, you know, breathe into the chest, so you really want to slow that down and, and you know, breathe into the belly. So you're activating that, you're more of the parasympathetic nervous system, that rest and digest, so you're really taking the edge off that, you know, tendency to want to breathe too much and panic. Um, and then you're working to um, focus on your key muscle areas of tension. And this is, again, across the board. So well, typically, it's the jaw and the shoulders for most of us. Mm. But really, for whatever instrumentalist it is, what area of the body are they, are they working with that's, that's, that can be affected most by this tension that's not in the, in the rehearsal space but on stage? And then you're getting into that space where you're... <laughs> down-regulating your energy, you're becoming grounded quite literally, mm. uh, and that's increasing the mindfulness of that moment, grounding into the moment, and really thinking then, hearing, seeing, feeling yourself uh, perform the, uh, the, the piece exactly like you'd play, want to play it, and I'm closing my eyes as I'm doing this, to really, you know, when that's clear in your mind, what you're doing, and as clumsy as it is, and you know the, the way that I explain it is, yeah, more left brain, right brain, left brain, critical thinking, right brain, more sensory motor. Um, that we know that that's that's a bit of an old-fashioned way of thinking, but that metaphor does kind of work. But anyway, okay. And and so the more that people are in there, then when they've had it, have it, they come up, and then they 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 are better uh, able to perform. And the other really important thing, beyond the moment, is counteracting that tendency to want to avoid whatever it is that we're afraid of. So if you're anxious mm. and performance anxious, the last thing you want to do really is to get on stage and expose yourself to more of that fear. Mm. Um, but so you've got a sequence, uh, a, a, a progression of performance activities in safe, you know, affirming environments as mm. much as possible to build that confidence again. Yeah. Um, yeah. Another question from the audience. Uh, Murray is... Uh, Asking, having a physical disability, I find I can hear and understand music well, but I struggle to get my internal ideas out through my hands. Any ideas to help? Kind of a... Sarah, want to have a go? Yeah, sure. So it depends, I guess, um, on what the actual disability might be as to what might underlie that. But sometimes we know the brain can get alterations or changes to the connectivity between certain networks and others. And um, that's probably um, one possible explanation. Uh, and, and the brain is incredibly plastic. Mm. Um, it has this remarkable ability to adapt. Uh, and we know that um, it can be used to help um, change that connectivity for other functions, not just for music functions, but for speech, for instance. So we've done work where we've looked at using um, singing to help people learn to speak again after a stroke, uh, where they've lost those particular network functions or pathways. So um, uh, I'm not sure what the basis of um, the disability is, but I would encourage that person to say, well, you know, you can still actually give it a go and, and work towards that because of this neuroplasticity issue. Look, I'm glad you brought that up because one of the stories I came across when I was preparing for this, the remarkable story of US jazz guitarist Pat Martino. <laughs> he, he had brain surgery as a result of an aneurysm and they removed a large chunk of the left temporal lobe. After surgery, he had no memory of who he was, of who his parents were, he went to live with his parents to recuperate and his dad played records of Pat's from earlier in his career, not long after the operation, and then strategically placed the guitar around in the room. The remarkable thing about this story is that Pat went on to pick up the guitar and play the guitar just as well after the aneurysm operation as he did beforehand. Uh, is, I, I, love, I love that story, and it tells us, doesn't it, so much about the brain's capacity to heal itself through plasticity. Mm. And it, well, what it also tells us is that, um, I mean, it's a really powerful example, is that there are multiple systems within the brain, and if one's not working, 
others can kick in and almost kind of commandeer or manage that function. This particular scenario tells us, though, that the, the, the memory system used to encode procedural or motor learning, that muscle memory, is different to the memory system that's used to encode semantic knowledge or autobiographical knowledge, i.e., uh, you know, who I am, who my parents are, who is the Prime Minister, <laughs> you know, that yeah. kind of thing. Facts about self or uh, the world. And we know that that's um, what that whole literature has taught us where um, we've worked with people who have had injuries. It tells us about the delineation of different networks. And um, the other networks can still continue... Uh, to, to function, take on those functions, and or the brain can reroute or or rewire. Um, and we we did this beautiful study with um, a, a person who had a very big stroke in his left um, hemisphere. Pretty much took out his whole hemisphere, um, lost the ability to speak completely, other than just a few very simple words. And we scanned him at baseline. And then we um, engaged him in an extensive three-month, um, what's called melodic intonation therapy. It's singing, mm. but learning to speak with a sung voice. Um, and then we scanned him again after that and showed that we'd pretty much been able to switch on um, that frontal area, but that also the right frontal area was really picking up a lot of the, the functions. So... This is the, the benefit of having MRI scanners. It's amazing, isn't right? it? We can see what's going on and we had this beautiful pattern that we could kind of longitudinally plot. Amazing. Um, and that changed his life, you know, uh, yeah. um, post-treatment. Because I mean, this is the thing. I mean, when people think about improvising, they might think, Tim, that, you know, every night you get on stage, you're going back to ground zero and rebuilding from scratch. But, of course, you're not doing that. No. You're having to remember... Memory is important. You're having to remember how to play, where the notes are, how to do it. You, you know, you're reconstructing it every night, but you're not building it from the ground, from the ground up. No. And yes, a story like that, where he can't remember who he was or who his parents are, but he can remember and relearn guitar just as well as before. It's just incredible. Yeah, someone, like, and I think I was saying this to you backstage, but I heard someone talk about Pat Martino as being the, one of the world's great jazz guitarists twice <laughs> because he because after his um you know the operation and whatnot he had he, he did completely relearn the instrument mm. um but yeah i think in terms of um on like what you do like the the way memory tends to operate when you're improvising it's um it's more I think it tends to be more in line with the concept, and, and again, there's, I don't think there's been much in the way of solid research done on this, but it tends to be, and from you know, looking at the, the, at the way improvisers do their thing, it tends to fit more succinctly with the, the concept um, in memory that we refer to as pr perspective memory, which is... Um, sometimes referred to as future memory too, right, mm -hmm. where you, you take images, um, auditory images, so the sounds in your head or visual images um, of things that you've already seen and, and then you reconstruct them to, to um, create a potential future scenario. So driving home today, you can imagine driving home because you've probably driven home from the, from the uh, recital centre before and then if I say there might be a random breath test, then you'll insert an image of a random breath test in there, even mm. though it's not happened yet, right? So improvisers tend to do the same thing. We, we take mm. the sounds of things that we've heard before, and it might be a whole kind of melodic phrase that we may have practised of our own or one that belongs to someone else that we've transcribed to, to, to gather the vocabulary, okay? Mm. To use another language and metaphor. Or it might be just one pit, like one pitch that we're then recombining in this novel way to, to create an improvisation. So my own feeling is that, and based on looking at the research that's going on, is it, it's probably more to do with that type of memory than you know, the, the more reconstructive memory that we might associate with learning a classical piece where you, know, you, you pull out the, the chunks and recombine them. You know? It's more, it's much more 
uh, manipulative. You know, mm. we, we're taking a chunk and then spinning on its head, but we're always constantly moving forward. You know? I mean, we're hearing a lot more, aren't we, about the therapeutic value of music and some preliminary research on dementia patients, mm -hmm. for example, who seem to have lost much of their memory but can remember songs, which mm -hmm. then, you know, trigger other forms of memory. Is it, I mean, is there a lot of potential in this form of therapy? You know, is there a lot that we can still learn that can assist people, uh, you know, who, who are, at the moment have lives that, uh, you know, where their memory has really paralysed them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a it's an area of research that's still in its infancy. Yeah. Um, and and here we're talking about the autobiographical memory system, right? So there there are there are many memory systems in the brain. We tend to think as if we just talk about memory um, as a, a single construct, but there we have multiple types of memory systems. And whenever we revisit a memory, we it's it's not like a CD recording that stays fixed in time, you know, cast down and, and is immutable. Whenever we revisit a memory, we change that memory in the moment of revisiting it. And I think this is really relevant to, to musicians and in particular improv, as Tim was talking about. Um, but we collect over time an autobiography. That is all those um, key events that happen to us in our life. And we know the ones that are highly emotionally charged are more likely to be remembered. Mm. So that's why we, we remember major mm. events like the birth of our mm. kids or our, our um, you know, wedding or whatever, big events in our life. And um, there are certain periods of our development, like our adolescence growing up, where we're forming our, our, our identity mm our sense of self, and we resonate with the music of our culture yep. and have strong emotional memories around that, you yep. know, our first kiss or our first, you know, formal or and all those things that went on. And um, we really lay those memories down really solidly. And our long, long-term memories from our youth are fairly... Um, resistant in that, mm. in, in that sense, and particularly if they've got strong emotional flavour to them. So, music, thinking of your own growing up. Yeah. You'll hear a song on the radio, you've still got all those lyrics in there. You can't Im imagine your brain has stored them all. You haven't sung that song in years, but there mm. it all is. You've not rehearsed it or heard it. Um, if you'd said, oh, remember this shopping list... 10 years on, of course you wouldn't because mm. it's, it's a completely different type of experience. So when people with dementia are getting reactivated um, by the songs of their youth um, and that powerful emotional period of their life, what that's really doing is calling up those pretty pristine or well-preserved memories because they are so powerful. And that gives them something meaningful that they can enjoy and experience when they're everyday memories of shopping lists or mm. where they left their car mm. keys aren't sticking anymore um, because it doesn't have that same salience. So there's a network in the brain called the salience network and it's linked to that autobiographical memory circuit and it tells the brain, ah, this is important, mm. you need to remember this. Mm. And uh, I think we need to understand far more about that in terms of how we use that to help people with dementia or other forms of brain uh, changes really still um, get maximum quality of life and enjoy life in these other mental states or ways of thinking. It's interesting, Margaret, isn't it, that when you think of the music and you talk to people and get them to discuss the music that's had the most powerful emotional impact on them, almost invariably it's the music they hear when they are younger. I mean, they live through a life and continue to enjoy music mm. perhaps all of their life. But the songs that trigger a really deep emotional impact are the songs from when we're younger. I mean, does it kind of mean that as we get older, we're less able to feel that emotional impact from... I'm thinking out aloud here a yeah. bit, but yeah. Less likely to feel the emotional impact of, the, of modern material or...? I mean, you might like a song, but 
you know, maybe it doesn't have that deep meaning and connection that the music that you heard when perhaps mm -hmm. you were in your adolescence or growing. I don't know. Uh, it, you know, it seems to be that when you do ask people about the, the songs and the music that really means something to mm -hmm. them, it's really the music they've heard last week or, you know, six months ago. Mm. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's yeah. a mystery, isn't it? I had a student write something that I had to uh, mark the other week that almost moved me to tears when I've heard it. So that was a nice, that was a nice feeling because mm. yeah. like Monty Python say, you know, like the older you get, the less funny everything is. You know, like because <laughs> everything funny that's half, like they've heard it all, right? Yeah. But, but yeah, every now and again something pops up. And Another thing I was wondering is what happens to us if we're deprived of music? I mean, if, if music lifts our mood, what's the corollary of being deprived of music? Does it make us more depressed? Is there any work being done on that? Oh, that's a very good question. I mean, um, we know that music is universal and there is no culture that doesn't have music. We're all hardwired, if you like. We come into the world hardwired for language and hardwired to um, enjoy and experience music. So it would be hard to imagine an experience where someone never had any exposure to music. We also know that we acquire music um, through a memory system that um, isn't explicitly conscious. So if you think about it, you know a whole bunch of songs, but you can't remember when you learnt them or where you first heard them, but you just know you know them. And you might even know the lyrics and you don't even remember ever learning the, myri the, the lyrics. And it's because it's coming in through this implicit memory system. Um, and, and music is enculturated, so all children really develop um, the capacity to respond to music even before they, they learn to speak. So it really is biologically very old yeah. and is thought to be a predecessor almost of language, certainly singing or some earlier versions of it. Uh, so no one's ever done the experiment where we've deprived someone of music. I don't know if we'd be ethically allowed yeah. to do that. No one's ever described a case of, of someone in the literature who's not had music. Mm. What, we, what we have done, though, is work that shows how music provides a really enriched environment. So we can compare children who have been raised in just a standard environment versus those who have had a very enriched musical environment. And when that happens, we see all sorts of changes in the brain mm. of the people who have had an enriched musical environment. And they're, they're, they're evident even from just eyeballing the, um, the brain scans, you know, in terms of mm. volume of cortical tissue, um, masses of fibres, um, in terms of their, their, their width and also degree of connectivity. And that has all these um, flow-on effects or benefits for other cognitive functions like uh, language, like memory, like attention. Um, so it's like music is this natural stimulant for the brain. It enhances brain performance more generally because it uses all those different networks. And it provides the... Um, it's a naturally enriching environment to maintain the health of the brain. It gives all those... Um, networks, a workout, if you like. Mm. Uh, and so not to have that, I guess we would just see a decline in those functions over time under the principle of use it or lose it, yeah. mm. which is a very real neurobiological principle that um, has been well demonstrated in the research. Mm. So that would be the mm. prediction, those things yeah. would just atrophy um, to a greater degree. Just had a quick Maybe this will have to be the final question, actually. Mm. Uh, just, quick, just quickly, actually, to you, Margaret. I mean, on, on, on performance anxiety, okay. we've heard all the benefits of music here, performing it, listening to it. We want our kids, when they're young, mm. to learn an instrument. Mm. How much of a barrier is it, though, at a young age, if you're learning to play piano, guitar, trumpet, you've got your school concert coming up, uh, and you're so paralysed by anxiety that it makes you not want to play at all? I mean, yeah. is this something that, if unchecked, could potentially stop thousands, millions of kids from, from learning music? Yes, 
In a word, yes, and completely. And that's 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 how I ended up in Melbourne. Um, uh, you know, understanding um, that the work that needed to be done in you know my own life, for example, yeah, that's why I'm here and made a career out of it. Because in adolescence, it was quite um, it exploded, and then you know the choke at the end of year 12 exam. And, you know, um, it, it's excruciating, and it can cause people to to put down the instrument, to disengage with musical activity, and and all the benefits, the health and well-being benefits that go along with it. Um, which is a tragedy. So, um, you know, working from the very beginning to set up safe performance environments, to really develop that, in, that um, uh, intimate kind of relationship and that, that intrinsic motivation and the joy of, of learning and performing music just for its own sake, not for an evaluative, mm -hmm. you know, scholastic endeavour. Yeah. Mm. But it, it, it's everything other than that, everything other than, you know, identity mm. and language and, and, you know, that we've talked about here today. Mm. Have to wrap it, I'm afraid. Thanks very yeah. much for coming along yeah. to this session today. Uh, do enjoy the festival. There's so much fantastic stuff on, so much great performance. Um, so glad you could come. Thanks to the uh, Melbourne International Jazz Festival for inviting us and thanks especially to our fantastic three speakers today, Sarah, Tim and Margaret. Thank you. See you later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.